Oh, newspaper men meet. Coming up on the Media Project, Alan Shartok, Ira Fussfeld, Judy Patrick, and I'm Rex Smith will be giving you some commentary and analysis on journalists this past week. Are journalists, in fact, rich elites, as Fox News has claimed? Is the January 6th committee making history by making good television, or is it overblown? And let's talk about a very controversial decision on the shooting video from Uvalde. Those topics, and a lot more, actually, coming up next. They wallow in corruption. Oh, newspapermen meet such interesting people. They know the lowdown, now it can be told. I'll tell you quite reliably off the record about some charming people I have known. For I meet politicians and grafters by the score. Killers plain and fancy, it's really quite a bore. Oh, newspapermen meet such interesting people. They wallow in corruption, crime and gore. Ding ling ling, city desk. Pull the press, pull the press. Extra, extra, read all about it. It's a mess, meets the test. Oh, newspaper men meet such interesting people. It's wonderful to represent the press. Now you remember Mrs. Sadie Smuggery. The Media Project is a half hour of commentary and analysis. We invite you to join in as a listener, and we welcome your thoughts at media at WAMC.org. I'm Rex Smith here with Alan Shartok, Ira Fussfeld, and Judy Patrick. We are your veteran journalists here to talk about journalism. And Alan, as a political scientist, which yes. you are, yes. I would like for your thoughts about this on this Media Project. There is a claim that the media is engaged in ageism by its coverage of Joe Biden. You know, he is 79. And now you've even seen it on the front page of the Times, Democrats saying they may need another candidate because they're worried about him. Is that ageism? Is he demonstrating anything that suggests that there's anything wrong with his performance? Well, Rex, I'm glad you asked that question of a soon-to-be 81-year-old. Well, I thought you'd be an expert yeah, on this. I think that the media has been wise enough to move their people around. Like, for example, we know that the New York Times does not keep people in place forever. Mm. They make sure that they move everybody along, unless their name is Sulzberger, of course, and even there they do. No, they do. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would think mm -hmm. that the media is conscious of how old people are and uh, whether or not they can still do the job, which I think is really the major criteria for keeping somebody or not. Yeah. Ira, have you seen any evidence? Well, yeah. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. The man is what he is, and we understand that not everyone that age suffers from declining cognitive skills, but some do. And I think it's a legitimate question to ask. I think where mm. what concerns me is when it's taken overboard. When Fox is not talking about a caravan of uh, immigrants or whatever the hot topic is for 18 hours, one of their threads on an almost daily basis is making fun of Biden's gaffes, et cetera, and pointing out that he's too old for the job. Well, I think that takes it a little too far, but I don't think there's anything wrong with the basic question of analyzing a person, the president of the United States, and say, should we, the voters, be worried because of what his age is? And of course, Ira, you make a very good point because it isn't impossible to think that some person who gets a job at a very young age is also called out and say, you know, basically, uh, he's just a kid. 
Well, sure, that doesn't happen as often, but it can happen as well. It's not an unusual nor untoward point to raise in, in, when you analyze something like this. Now, Judy, you, for years, ran a major newspaper. Not that many years. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't that old. Are you conducting ageism right now? <laughs> <laughs> but, Judy, think of it. I mean, Sharon Paris was 84 when he first became president of Israel, or prime minister, I guess. Queen Elizabeth is 96, you know. What do you think? Is I think she was a... 25 when she, well, she, she was a child. Like yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's an appropriate topic for discussion, but there's no set age for a president. It's not in the Constitution. You have to be at least 35, I think. But yes. the danger, however, is getting sucked into right-wing Republican talking points, and this definitely is one of them against Biden. I remember watching one of the January 6th hearings, which we had a really explosive testimony. The next day on the foxnews.com website, there was no mention of the hearing, but the dominant story was about Biden's age and whether or not he should run again. But also, Democrats are raising this as an issue. And I mean, we discussed Ronald Reagan's failing uh, mental acuity back in the day. And we had lots of discussions about Donald Trump and whether or not he passed any kind of mental stability test. I think the press has an important role in examining the health in all manner, mental and physical, of mm -hmm. our president. But there is a fine line between prejudice and doing it right. Right. And many of the reporters out there are young and look at someone who is 60, 70, 80. I mean, I I remember the first time I turned 60 and then I read a news article about someone being in an accident and they were elderly and they were 60. And I'm thinking, what? the elderly person? No, <laughs> if you're 60, you're not. So there is that bias built in. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah, don't I call somebody 60 elderly. All right. So you mentioned Fox News ignoring the January 6th hearings. Uh, you know, it's very impressive, isn't it? These January 6th committee hearings have been really good TV. Unbelievable. I find myself glued. I find my hand glued to the television. <laughs> Is that what <laughs> happened to your <laughs> hand? <laughs> <laughs> this is why Alan is injured. <laughs> but, you know, they're good without being slick. And I think if they were too slick, if the video was too mm. well produced, if it looked like a Democratic National Convention, I think that would undermine its credibility. But they have done a good job of being suspenseful. Liz Cheney ends everyone with this tidbit. Jeez, this, this, the next, sure. Yeah, you know, we're being manipulated. I think we should recognize that. And I think the press should do a better job of pushing for release of the transcripts of every witness's testimony beforehand. And we're not getting a lot of that. We're going along with it because the testimony is so compelling. But at the end of the day, I want us to do a far greater analysis of what they've collected and, and report it to the public. After all, you're right. They're one team. But hearings for congressional committees have always been orchestrated. Sure. So when I was a young congressional aide, I set up field hearings. What? You were once a congressional aide? Well, imagine that. Four years I was. But these are so good. There's like this strong narrative through line, like a good TV show. There's there's a separate theme for each episode. There's good use of video and sound. There's even a star of each show. Well, but let's not forget the reason that these are seen as good TV is because they're being produced by TV people. Behind the scenes, right. these are producers who are generating this program, and they're doing very well. And next year, we'll see if they get an Emmy for it. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. The reason that I was hired by this congressman was because I was a newspaper guy, and he wanted somebody to be able to do his press relations. Nowadays, if you want to communicate, Kate, you need somebody who's yeah, that kind of they've, a TV they've, producer. They've fit these hearings for the time, but I think Judy is, is 100% correct. I do feel sometimes we're being manipulated. As much as I am enjoying the narrative that they are presenting as it relates to being an anti-Trump narrative, I do wonder what the other side may be. Is, in fact, there another side to this story? And we're not getting it from these hearings. Now, that said, these hearings are far superior to those many hearings that we've seen where the congressmen... Uh, use their time to give speeches right. that uh, are self-serving at best. But it is true, right, Ira, that almost every word that anybody on that panel, because it is a one-sided panel because the Republicans didn't really want to make any contribution, although there is, of course, Liz and others to do that, it is true that every word is pretty... Uh, if it's not exactly it. scripted, it's pretty damn close, and it is all on the teleprompter. And, you know, and, but it's restrained. I don't think they're grandstanding, and they could if they wanted to, but that would, again, undermine the credibility. I am so glad it's not, a, it's not like a ben Benghazi-type hearing, which was, I mean, yes. I think that would have turned the public off tremendously. Exactly, and actually, I think Nancy Pelosi was very smart to say that Liz Cheney would be the vice chair, because that, I think, is what keeps it from being 
being grandstanding. It is the presence and, you know, the need to keep the conservatives from fleeing. That is, to keep Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger in cahoots, basically, you can't be a grandstander and just make points for the Democrats. I don't know that you're you're right about this, Rex. I'm sorry to have to say that to you because, you know, <laughs> I, know you I don't like that. to give you a hard time. No. But Liz Cheney, of course, is on the outs with the Republican Party, mm-hmm. and she will probably lose in her primary when she runs. And so therefore, you know, what do they have to, what does she have to lose? What do they have to lose in promoting her? Yes, but I think that Cheney would behave differently and the whole committee would function differently if she felt that this was purely a vehicle for democratic advancement. I mean, I think she's really in pursuit of justice here for, you know, justice against Donald Trump and his ilk who are have thrown her out. By you the know, way. it's almost like a story where there's not two sides. Mm-hmm. I mean, we always struggle in, in the industry to have both sides of the story. You know, it, it was one of our Achilles heels, I think. But this is an issue where there's a right and there's a wrong, it seems clear. There's not two sides to this story. Well, the Trump people would argue that there is two sides to the notion that it was Trump and Trump alone who generated the mob to go to the Capitol. Now, we can analyze that however we want, but there is another side, supposedly. He hasn't offered a defense very rigorously, but he's not getting a chance to do it at the committee hearings. Well, he doesn't offer it on his own platform. No, he, it's all social. name calling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, which suggests that there are no facts, you know, to Judy's point, that really support the other side. It's a stunning example of the use of the media by government to achieve what you could call as a political end, the political end being justice, the goal of justice for those who perpetrated this violence upon our democracy. Well, what do we say about the state of the media in this country that we have not said before on any number of other topics, and we've alluded to it here is that the ratings for these hearings and the people who are primarily listening to these hearings are people who are living in the same silo as the point of view from the hearings. The Fox News ratings go way down during the hearings and then they tick back up when the commentators come on. But there's a significant segment in this country who are either A, not listening to these hearings at all or disbelieve what they are hearing in the hearing. So what what is what do we do about that? So what is the question? I mean, the information is out there. We're hearing it. You can't avoid it. And so the way that I'm looking at it is, if it's is a democratic pooch, it certainly is effective. Well, who, who can't avoid it? Well, you can't avoid the fact that that information is out there. Right. But in fact, there are significant numbers of people who are avoiding it, who are not paying attention or so not. So what? Well, uh, so yes. what? I mean, do you think everybody watched, for example, as I did, the Keith Alver hearing? Yeah, I remember. That that was, oh, whoa. <laughs> that was a long other, time ago. You know, the, and, and the bulk of these have been during the day, which is low viewership. They've scheduled one for prime time. We'll see what the viewership is when that happens. Well, it's predictable based on what's happened. There, there, there'll be a lot of people who will watch it, but among those, that large group that will not watch it, are the right wing of the country. You can depend upon us, folks, to keep alive the memory of Estes Kefauver. <laughs> this is a fabulous thing. Here we well, are. Well, okay, I have one question for you, as long as we're on the subject. Of Estes Kefauver? Yes. yes okay. Why, what piece of apparel will forever be associated with Estes Kefauver? Probably the uh, good uh, Republican cloth suit, his opponent for the vice presidency in 1956. Wrong, sir. Bow tie? You, you, you are wrong, too, man. Uh, uh, I, I was going to say bow tie. No, I uh, believe it was a coonskin hat. Oh, oh yeah, I you, think you're, you're right. right. He was yeah. from Tennessee, wasn't he? Yeah. He was the wow. baby Crockett of You Congress. only get this here on the Media Project. <laughs> Alan Shartok, Ira Fussfeld, Judy Patrick, and I'm Rex Smith. If you want to share your memories, media at wamc.org. Did you have one of those hats? I did. I did, too. We were all watching Davy Crockett. Crockett. My big brother. I, I, I got myself a coonskin hat and I wore it to PS 75. <laughs> <laughs> and all the other kids on oh, the West upper West side were wearing yarmulkes. I was going to say, no, they, they were thought not. it was pay us, right? <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> Boy. This, is great. this is really great. Anyway, you know, speaking of Fox News, there is a controversy about the commentator on Fox who said that journalists are rich elites. Here is this commentator who says they don't care about uh, these issues. Issues, that is inflation and so on. Journalists don't care about these issues. And the reason they don't care is these issues is because they are not struggling with these issues. American journalists are part of the elites. They are rich. 
They are not out there struggling to pay for gas. They're not living in crime-ridden cities. Those are their neighbors who they don't care about. That doesn't sound to me like a fair assessment of journalism. Or well, is that's something... because you're a journalist. That's why it doesn't well, sound well, so well, great. Well, it's not, it's nonsense generally in, in that journalists are underpaid, particularly in <laughs> newspapers. Even when newspapers are doing better, journalists were underpaid. That said, for a long time now, there has been a sense that journalists who used to be the voices of the working people are not the voices of the working people anymore because while they're not elites and they're not rich, they're still making more money than the people that they used to be a part of in the lower class. So it's not a new allegation, but it's this one sounds more politically driven. What do you think about no, that, I Judy? No, I disagree. I think reporters, especially local reporters for local newspapers, make very little money. They're making in the mid-20s to mid-30s, and that's not very much money. The no, median no. wage was 36000 for newspaper reporters. Editors, median wage, 50000 But I think what this person is alluding to on Fox News, again, is a sort of elite mindset. Is that different from elite pay scale? Well, it's an interesting question that you raise, Rex, appropriately, and I'm glad you're our chairman so that you can, <laughs> you, you, you can do that because there is a certain snob appeal for those people who are working in journalism. Uh, there isn't? No. Well, among a certain segment. And if you watch network news or cable news, you'll see reporters calling in from their homes, and you can see the background. They live in really nice townhouses or condos in Washington, and they clearly With fireplaces. Make, and they clearly make a lot of money. Yeah. But the bulk, I would say 90% of the reporters, especially the print reporters out there, are struggling. When I first began, many of my colleagues were eligible for food stamps. They come from working class families. They go to state schools. They have a rich heritage of knowing their communities. They haven't gone to Ivy League schools. Their one claim could be that they're educated and they care, but I think this broad brush that they're elites is crazy. Okay, well, is there any relationship between the words elite and the semi-left? Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> there you go. We uh, have some of the same the, letters. We know that. <laughs> did you play Wordle this morning? I did. Uh, there you go. <laughs> what is this? My wife, my son, my my daughter, Rex, <laughs> Judy. It's no, good. I don't play it's it. a good mental exercise, Alan. It'd be good for you. Uh, this is the. Uh, I okay, mean, oh, Rex. I, now you. Now you made it. Oh he's wearing a cast on his hand. I think that was ageist. Uh, you know, it's good for all of us. I mean, that's why I do it, right? But actually, I think that the issue is this person might be thinking about network news correspondents, and we're talking about local news reporters, which is where the bulk of journalism is done. Now, with saying the fact that that's where the bulk of the downsizing has actually happened also. A fifth of the population of the United States now lives in a news desert. That is a community where there is nobody covering them. And even in those other communities, there is much less coverage. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, sir, I, would like, I would like to ask you this. A fifth live in a news desert. Uh -huh. Now, how does that compare with those people who have consigned themselves to a personal news desert by not looking at the news? Don't you see? News avoidance. This is a very big issue these days, and I think there is a mental health concomitant to that. Uh, I mean, I was just reading a fine piece in the Baltimore Sun on a psychoanalyst talking about the value of taking a break from the news because it is giving yes, people anxiety, mm. right? But these news deserts, mo most of the places where there are news deserts, the reason that they have become deserts is because the closing of the local weekly newspaper, not yes. the daily newspaper. And the local weekly newspaper, generally speaking, Judy, who's still involved with weeklies now, can confirm this. They do fairly well from a readership standpoint because of the coverage that they provide cannot be found anywhere else. The reason that they've died is because of the advertising revenue that had disappeared as moms and pops, who are the primary advertisers in smaller news newspapers themselves had problems and began disappearing. So I don't know that in the case specifically of deserts created by weekly newspapers going were news avoidance. I believe people relied on those newspapers because they couldn't find out about the school board or the honor roll or the little league scores anywhere else. Well, I disagree with all of you. I think after every <laughs> meal, there'll be a desert. Could be. So in one a, S or two. There's, there's one county in New York State, Orleans County, that doesn't have a newspaper, but that's because its newspaper merged with a paper and an enjoy County. There are 451 weekly newspapers in New York State and 51 or 52 daily. So there are a lot of newspapers in New York, at least. And I would also argue that 
if you're worried about an overload or a sense of news, newspapers compact the news all in one little handy packet for you. You take it, you read it, and you're done for the day. Or just like the nightly news, you get everything you need in 30 minutes and then you walk away. Or the radio station. Watch it. Our traditional platforms have consolidated it and eliminated the need for you to constantly check up on oh, the news. I see. So it's healthy to read the newspaper. But Mentally healthy, Very yes. few people well, do. Well, I've long you know. said to a broken record that the distrust and the dislike of the media that is expressed by many of our critics is really because of what they are seeing on cable news, that the rest of us are suffering disproportionately. And a lot of the criticism that people have of cable news, I have as well in terms of overkill and sensationalism and all the rest. You see far less of that in a print product and sadly, we are being lumped in with cable news and people dislike us or don't believe us. I think one of the reasons that there are so many critics of the news media is that the people who are being covered don't like it. Well, that's always been the case. Well, that's no way to yeah. dismiss a, well, a very healthy true. argument. People don't. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing new with that, Alan. <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to bet, at least I'll speak only for myself, I've been interviewed by other media and have been terribly displeased by what I've read about myself, and yeah. I wouldn't have written it the same way. Exactly. And it's a great object lesson, because now you know how the other side feels, the public feels Absolutely. when we come. Well spoken, Ira. Yeah. Well, the three of you ought to be ashamed. <laughs> yeah. No, I, actually, going back to my career as a flack, excuse me, as a spokesman, for the esteemed congressman yeah, like and uh, legislative aide, I think it made me a better journalist because I was stunned by the superficiality of the media coverage and the ineptitude of reporters who covered us in this 14-county area that uh, my boss represented. Also, though, unfortunately, it made me like a shark going after prey as a journalist because that is what a lot of journalists like to do, and having been on the other side of the notebook, I didn't like that kind of behavior. So maybe that affected negatively my reporting. I don't know. You know, when there's this demand for so much content, it's easy for reporters to fall prey to the quick and easy story and not spend the time they need to do a compelling story or a story that might be more interesting. And that is only increasing as the number of journalists working out there declines. Yeah, so easy to just pick up whatever the press release is from the member of Congress, get a little chunk of tape and go with it on the air, you know, or put it on the website. Especially if somebody's counting. Yes. And, and, How many and stories have you filed today? Yes. Uh, yeah. That is not great. Journalism. You never did that, did you, Judy? Counted stories? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or you, Rex? Well, I used to get a report uh, at the end of every month with every reporter of how many stories the reporter had filed, how many were on the front page, how many were on the region front. And it was, it was an issue. It is something you think about. It's something to take note of. Who's productive? And you weigh, you know, this reporter may only have had one story this month, but boy, was it a blockbuster. It was great. But it's just good data for you to have. I had a publisher who wanted us to base compensation on that, and that was never anything that was going to happen. Or you, Ira. Yeah, Rex just mentioned what I was going to say. There are some places where compensation for the editors was based on the story count. Oh. Uh, we, we did story counts every day for a time, and I'm trying to remember whether... What is the story count? I'm sorry. Well, you literally, in my case, I literally took the daily newspaper in each morning and I took out a red pen and I, and I marked up the number of stories. Literally, you know, today we had 63 stories in the paper. Yesterday we had 47 or whatever it was. I outlived that. I can't remember if I got on a soapbox, but I, seem to re <laughs> I, I was very fortunate that they respected what I was doing in Kingston. Well, you were and, the publisher of the year for this yes, chain. Yes, I mean, you were obviously making the money. So so I, uh, I was able to avoid that after a period of time. Yeah, yeah. Could you get I, some uh, credibility when you have economic stability. <laughs> this is good. But, you know, talking about some of these judgments that you have to make about what's valuable to cover and what's not, I want to go back just for a moment here to a, a story that our producer, Dave Gustina, has handed us about Uvalde. A couple of Texas news outlets, a TV station in Austin and the Austin American Statesman, have made people really angry by releasing on their websites and on the air, a video showing the cops milling around in the hallway at Uvalde as the children were being slaughtered in the classroom. And the video, while they've taken out the sound so you don't hear the children screaming, it does show the cops walking around 
in the hallway while this terrible stuff was going on. And people down there are very upset about it. Uvalde parents say this shouldn't have been released this way. And of course, the cops uh, don't like it. So the question is, did they, you know, did the news outlets do the right thing? What do we think? Very important piece of history and trying to analyze what happened here and could it have been avoided. I don't believe it was sensational in that there were no dead bodies. As you point out, the sound was turned down, but it was a very revealing piece of video, at least the part that I saw. And who can blame the parents for for being upset about it? You have have to have great empathy for them, but this is, I think, an important piece of the puzzle of what happened at Uvalde, and, and, and the media is, one of its roles is to sort it out, and this is a piece of the puzzle. You're absolutely right, Ira, because I have a feeling the next time, and there will be a next time, that something like this happens, the Uvalde spectrum, what, what happened there. Yeah, the lessons of Uvalde. Will, will, be, will yeah. be thought about. I mean, who could not be upset and stunned? One of the snippets of that video shows one of the uh, police people using the hand sanitizer on the wall. What would go through that person's mind to feel at that time he needed to wash his hands? Oh. It's a little thing. But it just speaks to the craziness of what was going on there. Right. And the, and the public has a right to know this. Right. And the editors and the producers oversaw this were careful to make sure to edit out things that really would have been just too much for the public to bear. The victims' families were scheduled to watch the full-length uh, video at some point, And they were upset because this was released before they got an opportunity to see it. Now, I can so, in some ways understand it, but this, this video is not just of the victims. This belongs to the public, and um, I wonder whether or not, if it hadn't been leaked, if we would have ever seen it. And it just magnifies the problem. And isn't it interesting that it was released on a print newspaper's website? So Mm -hmm. the video, it's another indication of the changing landscape of media. It was the print newspaper's video side that released this information, not the TV station. This whole question of what the public's right to know, which we talk about here all the time, is, I mean, today there's a story on the wires about the mayor of New York who has a secret office. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> he has a secret office. Do we have a right to know that he has a secret office that, that is funded and, you know, carry it through? And a lot of interesting material comes to us that, from places that we don't expect. Now, now, for example, Alan, you're now writing on this fine new uh Newish website in the in the Berkshires, you know the Berkshire Edge, uh, which was, thank you for that. We right? haven't talked about that in that's, weeks. That's, that's, I know. Uh, you're not yeah, going to yeah. mention that woman who does the blogging. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. And but like I was just reading some very interesting uh, political news on something called I think YonkersTimes.com. Who's ever heard of something from Yonkers? I, I do because I had a girlfriend in Yonkers. Well, <laughs> I went to the racetrack in Yonkers. <laughs> but how did you find that site? Well, actually. <laughs> on an <laughs> aggregator on Empire Report, uh, Empire Report. Uh, com, uh, which I look at every morning, which aggregates content, including Alan's column and mine uh, from the Upstate American. That's right. But I wouldn't have found it otherwise unless I was searching, right. probably, for the topic. And this was about potentially the inside story of why the chief judge of New York, Janet DeFiore, resigned abruptly. Why did she? Oh, well, uh, you'll have to read uh, yonkerstimes.com. I shouldn't just give it away here without a good link. Why not? Um, Without proof. Yes, and I wonder the fact that I haven't seen that on timesunion.com or in my times. Why is that? Is it because it hasn't been as well vetted journalistically because this is an unknown site, but maybe not. Maybe this guy is just, uh, maybe he got the story. I'm not saying the story is wrong, but I do think you're right. The bigger organizations are being a little bit careful before they print that. Mm -hmm. And if you just relied on the press release from the judge's office, she retired because she wants to spend more time with her family. (laughs) They always do, don't they? Those lucky families of people who retire. All right, that's all we have time for today. Yeah, I'm sorry, Alan. I know you'd like to keep going. Good. But you have another show to do, and that means we are done here. Gratitude to you for listening and to David Gustina, our fine producer, Alan Shartok, Ira Fussfeld, Judy Patrick, and I'm Rex Smith. Thanks for joining us this week on The Media Project. Their policy is an acrobatic thing. They claim to represent the common people. It's funny Wall Street never has complained. Ah, but publishers have worries, for publishers must go To working folks for readers and to big shots for their dough Now publishers are such interesting people 
It could be prostitution, I don't know. Ting-a-ling-a-ling, -a -ling, circulation, ting-a-ling-a-ling, -a -ling, advertising, get those readers, get that payoff. What a headache, what a mess. Oh, publishers are such interesting people. Let's give free cheers for freedom of the press. 